rent and offering. Uh, you guys know the drill here. For those who ask how they can give back prayer and financial support, you can do it online. It helps our ministry have a roof overhead and so forth. For those who desire, we are going back to Minnesota in, in mid-June, uh, um, a little bit uh, longer than a month from now. And if you want to be part of that uh, endeavor to help uh, bear that expense, you can do that as well. All right, let's get into our study in the book of Second Thessalonians. Now, as we begin this, this morning, as you can see, it's a Sunday. We're in our regular Second Thessalonians uh, study. We're in the last verse, Second Thessalonians 3.18, at the last part of the verse especially, uh, well, the, the entire verse there, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. But it, for the first time in recorded history that I can remember, I was talking to Ryan, we're going to do a dual study, well, one study, but for dual, dual books, dual purposes, because our Wednesday study in Colossians is coming to an end, Colossians 4.18. But they actually say the same thing. So what I'm going to do, since we're at the end of this book and the end of that book on Wednesday, I'm going to teach one pass, one, one, one study, and then Ryan's going to make it for both. Okay? Do you want it to be it's grace? Like, it's like uh, a, do you want it to be grace be with you or grace be unto you? Let's see. The grace of our Those Lord Jesus Christ be with, be you. with you. All right. Let's do that. I, I was going through all the passages. My, so let's let's put it. Grace be with you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, because they are both that. Right. They're right. unto you sometimes, but both yeah. of the verses are with you. Right. Okay, grace be All right, grace be with you. All right, so so that's the first time we ever did that, so I, I'm actually excited. It's like a, it's like a uh, simulcast in the political <laughs> realm. You, you watch one channel, then another channel is the same thing. Well, you're going to get two different endings, uh, t- two different books, the same ending. And that's because it's important how Paul ends this book. If you look with me at... It seems like the grace be unto you are kind of like in the beginning. That's true. That's, that's true. Um, and, I, and I got a few verses here, so we're going to be going through some of them. But it could... <clears throat> grace be unto you in peace. That's what I'm thinking. From God our Father and, and the Lord right, Jesus Christ. In the first chapter. And with the grace be with you, or you all, or be with thee sometimes. We'll see different ones uh, at the end. Mm-hmm. So today, we're, we're technically... 2 Thessalonians 3.18, so we're going to end the book, and we're going to go into 1 Timothy uh, next week, so be prepared for that. There's equal amounts, interesting. There's five grace be with you, five grace be unto you. Oh, man, five good. In the beginning, five, five and five. There you go. Five in the beginning, five in the end. And then we're going to actually, uh, after the Colossians study, which is going to be today, we're going to end the Colossians study today, we're going to go into the book of Galatians. So we're going to be in two new books next week. First Timothy and Galatians, okay? So I'm, looking, I'm excited, looking forward for both. But let's end 2 Thessalonians 3.18 and Colossians 4.18. Um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 18, I'll read that. I'll read Colossians 4.18, and then we'll have a word of prayer. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 18. The apostle says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Go over to Colossians. Go back a few pages. Colossians chapter number 4. As he ends that book, uh, we saw this part last time, verse 18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul. By the way, he says that in 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, 17 as well. Here he adds, remember my bonds. That's what we ended at last week. Uh, The bonds were why he was in prison for that message. The bonds represented the suffering for the mystery, okay? Then he says, grace be with you. And again, he says, amen. Uh, Speaking of amen, let's give the Lord uh, praise. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you for his uh, precious shed blood on Calvary's cross. May we never take that for granted, Father. That's the only reason why we, as humanity, can have a relationship with you, the true and living God. So we thank you for the suffering, the sacrifice of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our precious Savior and Lord. Father, we thank you for one another in Christ, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, We especially pray for those who don't have other uh, grace believers to fellowship with on a regular basis in person. The dynamic is, is totally different in person. Even the Apostle Paul, who had no uh, rest in his spirit when he could not find his brother Titus just to be in the flesh. So we thank you for that privilege and honor that we have, Father. Uh, we thank you for uh, your holy word. As we look into this study today, as we end the books of Colossians as well as Second Thessalonians, we give you thanks and praise. Uh, May this one little phrase, grace be with you, 
uh, be etched in our hearts and souls, the meaning of it. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. All right, go back to, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse 18 as Paul goes through the entire thing. In verse 17, it's interesting. The same thing he said to, Col to the Colossians, he said to the Thessalonians. As I was thinking about it, it's because of the faithfulness uh, of these two uh, group of saints. Both the Thessalonians were, were suffering for the truth as, and, 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 and the, the Colossians were faithful in that truth. And notice in verse 17, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I write. And again, you, you know, in the context of this book, there were false letters, counterfeit letters and so forth as from Paul. And he says, no, don't believe those things. They were they were they were uh, trying to be they were being deceived uh, by Satan with those things. Paul wants to make sure they know that he, he this is authentic and he would verify it uh, with his own signature and so forth. And as he ends the book, I want to talk to you about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And, and, and as he says over in other passages, grace be with you. Um, I was thinking about how can I explain grace? Well, we've heard grace explained or or defined in a number of ways. Many of these ways will be familiar to your to your ears. But I'm going to show you as we look at the Apostle Paul and his use of God's grace. It's beyond just simple. You, you've heard grace defined sometimes. Uh, one brother come up with a, a very good uh, acronym for grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. And, and that's pretty good because that, that's truly uh, the grace of God. We receive the riches of God's grace, as Paul says in Ephesians, as heirs of God through what Christ did at Calvary. His suffering, his sacrifice, we are allowed by the grace of God through our faith, just trusting what Christ did at Calvary, we receive the riches of the heavenly places as believers today. That's good. We've also heard grace defined as unmerited favor, right? You've heard that probably growing up. Uh, undeserved kindness. That's another way of uh, describing God's grace. And, and, and while that's true, it's even beyond that. When we talk about the unmerited favor or undeserved kindness, Particularly that that focus of Ephesians chapter number two, verse eight and nine. If you go there, go over to Ephesians chapter number two, verse eight and nine. Let's look at that. It's one we probably already know by heart, but I just want to re re refresh your memory about the wonderful grace of God. And, and by the way, let me let me put this. That's as opposed to the law. OK, uh, a performance based acceptance system okay all right look at ephesians chapter number two and verse number eight paul says for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not of works lest any man should boast so here when paul is bringing up the grace of god he's talking about that unmerited favor that undeserved kindness but in, in, in relationship to our salvation, and when I say our salvation, like any word, uh, the context, he's talking about our, from our, our soul salvation from hell, okay, and ultimately the lake of fire. And God's grace, that's what Ephesians is focused on, God's grace because of what Christ did on the cross is now available to all men, okay? There's the salvation of your soul from hell, and if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, and him alone and what he did at Calvary alone, God will save you by his grace. And, and what that is, that's versus the law where it was a performance based acceptance system where they had to keep the commandments in order to receive the end of their, their faith, which is the salvation of their soul. And when you rightly divide God's word in prophecy outside of our dispensation of grace, what makes the dispensation of grace unique is called the dispensation of the grace of God or the dispensation of God in Colossians. It makes what makes it unique is because it's the only time where faith alone saved you. Here it was faith. It was God's grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Noah had faith, but Noah had to do something. He had it was plus works. OK, plus works. And what the Apostle Paul says is not of works. Why? Why even emphasize that? Look at verse nine. It, it, it's clear in verse eight. For by grace are ye saved through faith. 
and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That salvation is the gift of God. But just to show you, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Peter didn't have that. Peter, in the book of Acts, chapter 10, he says, he that worketh righteousness is accepted of him. Okay? The point is, it's only in our present unique dispensation of grace where God saves you by his grace through your faith alone. You have everlasting life. It's called eternal security. And that's what most people think about, I pray, when they think about the grace of God. That's one aspect. But that's not the entirety for you and I today. OK, when we talk about God's unmerited favor, undeserved kindness and so forth, it extends not just to our soul salvation. That's one part of it, as opposed to the law where you have to work and perform in order to even get saved in the kingdom. Those people outside of our dispensation of grace, both in time past and after the dispensation of grace, it's going to be grace. Plus, uh, excuse me, grace. Faith. Plus works again. That's why James chapter two, he says, shall your faith alone save you? Are you by works? A man is saved and not by faith only. See, if you don't rightly divide, you take away from the distinction of the dispensation of grace. But something beyond just that issue of your soul salvation is at view when you talk about the Apostle Paul. Um, not only is your position an issue, your position in Christ, as Ephesians would talk about. Where you're justified by grace, you're accepted in the beloved. He'll save you freely, no works. Romans 3, the prescription there, being justified, what? Freely, by his grace. That positional justification declared righteous, that initial, I'm going to say it like that, initial. Because even what we're going to learn, initial, initial, okay. Even what we're, what we're going to learn in Galatians study is that Paul will use the word justification or justified as far as your walk too, okay? But when we're talking about your initial justification, your position in Christ, your salvation of your soul, that's all by unmerited favor. You don't merit that. You can't merit that. You're dead in sins, Ephesians says. But God favors you. It's undeserved kindness. You don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. He's kind to us. He saves us, okay? But it, it extends beyond that. It's not just our position when Paul talks about the grace of God. It's our practice as well, right? It extends to our practice. Um, it has to do with, he talks about, here he says, we are accepted in the beloved, Ephesians chapter number one, okay? In the beloved. They got songs and everything. In the beloved, accepted in I, right? Well, that's true. Positional, initial justification. But then Paul would go on in 2 Corinthians 5 and he'd say, hey, when he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ, he'll say that we might be accepted. We might be accepted or acceptable. OK, so there is another thing when it comes to the grace of God. Yes, it's unmerited favor, undeserved kindness in your position, your initial justification, your salvation from hell. You accept in the beloved positionally Ephesians. But then there's the practice, the practical application of that, because if you look at Ephesians chapter two, look at Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. He says, for we are his workmanship after you're initially accepted, after you're saved, after we're saved, we have a purpose. It's not just to live our life the way we desire. It's a purpose. Notice that issue of workmanship. It's like craftsmanship. You know, if you're crafty, I'm not crafty with my hands. If I touch your car or anything in your house, try to fix it, it's going to get worse. I'm going to tell you that. That's not my gift. Of, every man has his proper gift of God. It ain't that. I need saint. We need saints to help. I wasn't gifted in that way, but there are some men who are gifted and craftsmen. They take great pains and they pay attention to details that you and I don't even care about. Maybe even not even notice. That's God. He is a craftsman and he created the body of Christ. Paul in first Corinthians 12 says God has tempered. Think about that. When you think about tempered still the craftsmen, they burn it, they fix it and do it. They temper it together. God has tempered the body together as it pleased him. God put some work into this. He didn't just throw this together. Notice it says we are his workmanship. But every craftsman creates something 
so it can be utilized, right? These craftsmen, when they create a car or something, they want it to function the way they desire it to function. Well, notice what the, what the purpose of the body of Christ is. For we are his workmanship. He's the master craftsman. Create, by the way, he tells us too to be workmen. There's that word, workmen. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. He wants us to have that same spirit as we deal with his word. Workmen that needed not to be ashamed. And that, that shame is going to come up with our practice. Our, we'll see that in a minute. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you know there's a push today, even amongst dispensationalists, to blur the lines of the dispensation of grace with prophecy? Now, they're not out there saying, well, per, like, like, like other people outside of dispensationalism, that you have to do something, do some type of work to be saved. They're not saying that. They're saying, hey, it is by grace through faith plus no works. But they're saying no works of any kind at any time. That's just not true. And the moment you say stuff like that, you take away from the glory of the dispensation of grace. It's just wrong division on the other end. On the other end, right, which is still wrong division. <laughs> Because, yes, you're not you're not hindering people to get saved, justified for the initial, but you are hindering their understanding and appreciation. Yea, their understanding of, of, of these uniqueness of, of Paul's message. You're, you're hindering their reward. And that's the issue of when Paul talks about the grace of God, because there's some riches at Christ's expense beyond just your salvation. There's the reward of the inheritance. OK. There's the look at look at um, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Notice it's in Christ Jesus. This is something he suffered and paid for and that we're to suffer with him. Because you can go down there. The, 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 there's, there's probably a Catholic church that says grace, whatever. There's probably a Protestant church or some other denomination, grace, whatever. We, we drive, I see Grace Bible Church. I said, we should have that building with that, you know. <laughs> what what they, they wasting their time with that. It would be for us. Well, people talk about grace, grace. The Catholics talk about grace. Everybody talk about grace. But what truly is the grace of God? The grace be with you. Well, initially, God wants us to rest knowing that we have eternal security. That's the first aspect. When Paul says to these saints... Look at, um, hold your, well, I'll just quote. When he says to both the Thessalonians, as he ends that book, and as he ends that book by saying, the grace be with you, okay? He's saying, make sure you're mindful that you can now rest in your salvation, okay? That's number one. God is not putting you under the bondage of a performance-based acceptance system in order to get into the kingdom. You have it. Because he's contrasting that with, the law program. He's saying, look, there was a time where mankind had to perform short account system in order for God to even accept them. They have even a sniff of the kingdom. They had to perform. And Paul, he ends this great book, by the way, with the Thessalonians, they were all worried about and we're going to go through the tribulation. Does God not love us anymore? All these things. They were worried about stuff, trouble. And Paul says, hey, the grace of God, grace. Of, he says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at hold your hand here. Go, go back to second Thessalonians. So I'm gonna go back and forth. Go look, look at second Thessalonians. Notice how he says this. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse 18. He didn't just say the grace of God. He says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he calls him the Lord, he said, listen, the righteous judge. He has judged you all worthy. Relax and understand that he accepts you. Listen, he said, Paul is saying, let let that understanding that the righteous judge is accepting you. And, and you know, it's, he's talking about the person. Of him. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And we'll deal with amen in a moment. So he wants them to understand they can now rest because the righteous judge has determined that they have trusted his righteousness at Calvary. They can rest. He's not going to hold. He's not going to judge them to the point where he rejects them. He'll never take away their salvation. They have eternal security. OK, but he also mentions the Lord for this to motivate, because at the end of chapter three, he's trying to motivate some busybodies to 
continue on. And continue on in what? Go back to chapter 2 of Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter number 2. Because yes, we're saved by grace through faith. No works. Yes, we have everlasting life as a free gift. We have eternal security. But God saved us for a purpose. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. And by the way, I'll commend to you guys a a study we've done uh, about a year and a half ago about uh, unto good works. It was a four-part study, I believe, where we went through all of this. Well, let me show you. It's on on YouTube. Verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, God the Father's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, the one who suffered and died for us, who we're, we're we're to enter into his suffering in the truth, unto good works. So good works are important. Not for salvation, but they are important after you're saved. Which God hath before ordained. He thought so much about this in his craftsman mind that he already had ordained that we should, the key word is what? Should walk in them. And that's our walk of faith. When we talk about the grace of God that we should walk in, go over to Ephesians chapter number 3. Go over to Ephesians chapter number 3. Look at Ephesians chapter number three. In Ephesians three, here's the best definition of grace when it talks about as far as the Apostle Paul. Look at verse eight. Ephesians chapter three, verse eight. Unto me. So it starts with Paul. This grace is unique. Peter talks about in our first Peter study, he talks about the grace that should come unto you. Right. First Peter two. Israel is looking for the grace. Uh, Zechariah talks about the spirit of grace and supplication. Right. We see a lot of that in the book of John, the gospel of John that we're going over on Wednesdays. It means Jehovah God is gracious. John shows the grace of God. By the way, would Israel be in that new covenant? Okay, in that kingdom, in the land and so forth. He's going to give them the spirit of God and all those things. The land is there. People forget about the land, but land new covenant is not in effect yet. They got a taste of it, but they're not in the land without their enemies hurting. them. Okay, here's the point. They're not on the land anyway. They got a. a little bit of the whole thing. It's, 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 it's a tremendous amount. All right. So here's the point. That's the grace of God. The spirit of grace and supplication. All the way back to the Genesis. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. But God has never had a dispensation of grace. Where it's just he accepts a person by faith alone forever. Okay. Positionally. But he didn't just save us to get us into heaven. He saved us to reign with him. That's the reward of the inheritance. Okay, that's that's after you're saved, the reward of the inheritance. Colossians 324. Okay. by the way, knowing that of the Lord, this is of the Lord. This is the one the righteous judge gives you the the, being an heir of God. the, The father gives you this one here. This one comes from the father. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 3. That's the focus of Ephesians. What did daddy give us? But there's something that the son of God, the faithful son of God, because he reigns. He will reign. Let me say that. He, he's going to reign. He hasn't reigned yet. Hasn't, he hasn't been coronated. He hasn't cleaned the heavens yet. Rain but when delay. he does, said it, rain, rain delay. delay. That's right. When he does, he's going to share that with some faithful, loyal people. He's going to share his reward of the inheritance. He has his body. He has his, his, his citizenship. But what he doesn't have is the entire reign yet. It's been delayed. And now he's looking to share that with some faithful people. But you have to earn that. That's what the works are about. Look at that, look at that passage again. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. Unto me. So this is something unique to the Apostle Paul. Who am less than the least of all saints. Remember how the Apostle Paul saw himself? Just like Moses was under the law, Paul was under grace. He was the meekest man on the face of the earth in his day. Because he saw himself as not as over everybody, although his position was as the Apostle. He would meet the the lowliest saint and says, you know what? I'm a servant to you. That's Paul, the man. 
who am less than the least of all saints. Find the least saints. He says, I'm less. And you know why he says that? Because he persecuted the church of God and wasted it. When we get to Galatians, we're going to see how Saul of Tarsus, who Paul was before he got saved, how he hurt and harmed the Jewish believers on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he never got over that. Never. In his mind, he should have been destroyed on the road to Damascus. The Lord should have destroyed him and sent him to hell. And he never forgot the fact that he, instead of sending him to hell, he saved him everlasting life. Paul was the first man ever to receive everlasting life as a free gift forever. By no works. And he appreciated that. That's why he could say, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace. It's a particular grace given. And when he says, grace be with you, he's thinking about this particular grace. What's, what's that? That I, that's Paul, should preach, that's warn and teach, Colossians 1, among the Gentiles, something unique to Paul. The last time you think about among the Gentiles over in Joel, I believe Joel chapter 3, God says to the prophet Joel of Israel, he says, you go and preach among the Gentiles. The wrath is coming, buddies. It's coming. Not that grace is coming, or the wrath is coming. Among the Gentiles, notice the unsearchable. These are things you can't search out in the Holy Scriptures. Nowhere in all Old Testament and even Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nowhere before Paul can you find that God's going to deal with, lost gen with Gentiles, lost Gentile heathens, without Israel. Gentiles, period. Even when he dealt with Gentiles in the past and will in the future, whether it's outside of dispensation of grace or even in the kingdom, it's all about Israel first. Given to Paul was a unique mystery that you can't find that God would have amongst the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, the one who suffered and the one who will share his riches, if so be that we suffer with him. That's what Paul is saying. Look at verse 9. And to make all men see, both Jew and Gentile, what is the fellowship of the, of the mystery. See, Paul calls his message, you know what? You know what's synonymous with the grace given to Paul? It's called the mystery. The mystery of Christ, okay? And the appearing. Yep. Yeah, some, some, some other phrases. Preaching He'll talk the about cross. the appearing. That's First Timothy chapter number one. The preaching of the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the cross. It, that's Galatians, that's 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians, my different gospel. my gospel. And that issue of the mystery, it's something that's unique, unsearchable, hidden God. All of these things. That's what Paul is talking about. And when you and I, when he says grace be with you, he says, let this information be with you, be in your mind, be your motivation, because that's where the reward of the inheritance is the issue. Not for your salvation, but for your reward. Let me show you something. Let me, when I was thinking about grace, I wrote something. God has been gracious from the beginning, but his dealings with man, Adam, describe what grace is. Let me show you what grace is from the beginning. God says to Adam, he says, of, uh, let's go, go. Go back to Genesis chapter number two. Go back to Genesis chapter number two. I, bet, I don't want to miss a. Uh, 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 I owe this. Look at Genesis chapter number two. Genesis chapter number two. Yes, sir. Fruitful multiply. Heaven and earth. Give me one second. Something. Okay, Genesis two. Look at verse fifteen. Genesis two, verse fifteen. Now let's look through it. And the Lord God took the man. Now, this is Adam pre-fall. He just, he's, just, he's just been created. And put him into the Garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. Okay. And the Lord God commanded. Here's a commandment. The man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest. What's that next word? Freely eat. Right? Freely. Freedom. Liberty. Freedom. God dealt with his son before the fall. Perfect Adam at that time. Perfect humanity. He says he gave him freedom, but he, he, it came with something. He says, thou mayest freely eat. Verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. 
For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we see that God gave man freedom, but it's with responsibility. Responsibility. Ability, okay. And consequence or accountability. At no time did God ever make grace. You just go ahead and do whatever you want to do. That's what Satan wants people to think. See, that's why that's why denominations, of religions put this bondage on you to make you work to, to even get saved or stay saved because they don't truly understand God's grace. It's freedom with responsibility and consequences. We receive grace. We receive salvation free. But God does have responsibility and consequences, just like with Adam. Adam. And the responsibility for Adam was don't eat of that tree. And if you do, the consequence or accountability is thou shalt surely die. Well, it's the same with God's grace today. We're freely accepted. We're justified freely by his grace. But hey, there is responsibility. There are good works that God has before ordained that we should walk them. And those are good, good works of grace. You know, I, t I remind people, Paul says, you know, we're quick to go to Romans 614. And, you know, we don't really quote the passage all the way. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under, for you are not under the law, you're under grace. And we just say, yeah, Paul says we're not under the law, you're under grace. That's true. But you're under grace. You're under it. That means you're subject to God's grace. He has work for us to, be, to, to do. We went through it in the good work study. So all, even from the beginning, grace is faith, uh, excuse me, freedom with responsibility and consequences. And what the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, if there's no consequences before that, if there's no, if there's no responsibility, why would he need the judgment seat of Christ? The judgment seat of Christ would be useless. There's a judgment seat of Christ because he, he wants to see who has been loyal, who has been faithful, who's, who, who's been found faithful. Okay, And he will determine your faithfulness. So the grace of God given to Paul, he talks about being under that grace, is synonymous with the mystery of Christ. So what I want to do here is I want us to go through some verses, okay? And let's look at the Apostle Paul and this issue of uh, the grace of God. Go to Romans chapter 16, if you will. So with the time we have left, we'll just go through some verses. You know, the 2 Corinthians 8, 9, I feel like sums up. God's grace perfectly. Let's go there. Let's so, go there. Second Corinthians eight and nine. That's a great but I probably interesting have... too because you got Ephesians two eight and nine. Second Corinthians eight and nine. So both great verses. Eight and nine. That's numbers, right. right. Eight. <laughs> two, new eight, begin. Two, new beginning. Two, right, fruit two, of the spirit. Eight, nine as well because it's Second Corinthians. Ephesians two eight and nine. Think about that. Two eight and nine. Right. A witness to new beginning, and nine is the fruit of the spirit. Fruit there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You can get, thank you for that. Look at look at Second Corinthians eight nine. Oh, I love this one. Yes. Right. Second Corinthians 8, 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, obviously Paul is talking about the time before he became a man. He was, he was rich in glory and so forth with the Father. Yet for your sakes he became poor. And if you try to compare his, his life in, 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 from everlasting to his human life, his earthly life, he was poor. Even during his earthly life, he had nothing. The Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. That ye through his poverty, even down to the point where he was rejected by the religious leaders of both Rome, uh, Israel as well as Rome to, to the point of death. Through his poverty, by him sacrificing himself through his poverty might be rich. And that's spiritual, spiritually enriched, as Paul would say. Spiritually, rich, uh, spiritually lifted up, spiritually enriched. Um, on that, it makes me think about go to Philippians chapter number. Go back, go to Philippians chapter number three. Of course, that it, that spiritual enrichment includes the access that can get us the access, right? You get the access. That's where it starts. Once you're saved, Romans chapter five, verse two, he says, "Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ." There's our position, our initial justification. That's our salvation of our soul there. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's by faith. That happens by faith when we first trust him, the first faith there. But then he goes on in Romans 5, verse 2, by whom also. So there's an additional thing. It's always an additional thing. Mm -hmm. 
we have access by faith. That's that walk of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Second uh, Corinthians five. Uh, Second Corinthians five. Paul says, "By whom also we have access by faith into this what grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the what the glory of God." Do you know what he wants to do here? He wants to share his glory. Thank you for that, Ryan, because you know what? That's exactly what Philippians chapter two says. Listen, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What does that mean? He's saying God is willing to share his glory up there. Mm -hmm. watch, watch, watch it. Philippians. Uh, what did I tell you? Uh, Philippians chapter number. What did I tell you? Philippians three. three. Philippians. No. What the? Philippians chapter two. Sorry. Give me Philippians two. Philippians 3 is good, too, but Philippians 2 is one I was looking for. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. 2, 2 verse 5. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, the one who suffered for this truth, Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. God is more than willing to share his glory if it's done his way. Do you understand that when he created Adam, Adam was to share. Adam shared God's glory. The reason why he and Eve didn't even focus on their nakedness, God's glory shined out through them before the fall. He says, but made himself of no reputation. When it says he, he was rich, he was in the form of God. He says he made himself of no reputation. There is he becoming poor. And took upon him the form of a servant and made in the likeness of man. We went all through all of this in detail in our Philippian study. There's him humbling himself. Well, he became a man, but he humbled himself even more. Verse 8. Look, look at all of this. He starts up here in the form of God. He was the Godhead himself. And he just constantly going down, down, down. Watch this. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. So what happened when he became a man? And being found, by the way, I, 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 the world always talking about ascending, ascending masters, all this nonsense that Colossians was, was had to uh, fight, in, in, uh, Paul had to fight with Colossians. The Lord Jesus Christ, he condescended, he, con he descended, he, went, he kept stepping down. The Masons say, hey, step up to 33 degrees. Just go up, 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 up. Go up the corporate letter. God says, nope, go down, 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 down. And God did. The Lord Jesus went down, down. Notice here. Verse number nine, uh, seven. Excuse me, verse eight. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. So even when he became a man, he had humbled himself as God. He, 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 listen, he humbled himself as God became a man. Not even an angel. You know, Hebrew says made himself. It says he was made himself even lower than the angels, right? Angels are more power, powerful and, and have more glory than man right now, right now. So he didn't even come take up the form of an angel. He became a man, the seed of Abraham, Hebrew says. Now watch this. And being found in fashion, verse eight, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. I mean, humanly speaking, the worst fate for a human being is death. Being murdered. That's what happened. He was murdered. For nothing. For doing nothing wrong. And not. Check this out. That, he was willing to die. Sacrifice and offerings thou would is not but a body has not prepared. He knew that. He was, to, he was to die as Israel's conquering Messiah. Suffering Messiah who conquered through death. As he did all those miracles and he healed these lepers and he says, go offer this, the sacrifice Moses commanded as a testimony to those priests. They should have said only God can heal leprosy. Who did this? Jesus did it. He's the Messiah. And they were to take him and, and bow down to him and say, Messiah, it's time. Everything Moses has been teaching us on the Passover, it's time. And took him and put him on the altar Bind the sacrifice to the corns of the altar and sacrifice their Messiah and wait for be raised again. That same blood that they had been doing in type and shadow would be real. It's the blood of the New Testament, the, the cup of the New Testament in my blood. He said it. But instead of just dying, he became obedient to, unto death. Verse eight, even the death of the cross, that's even a worse death. 
There's a heroic death as the Messiah on the altar in the temple. This was a cursed one in, in many ways because they rejected him. They put him out of the city. Beyond that, they gave him over to the Romans. They didn't even have the wherewithal to do it. He didn't die by Jewish hands. He died by the hands of Roman Gentile heathen dogs. Let me tell you about these Jews. It would be much more. They, I mean, listen, he Jews, if they had to choose, would stone to death by the hands of my own people like Stephen or handed over to these heathen Gentiles and crucified. They would have said it's like people try to choose Hillary over Donald. They like, man, we do which one. The Jews would have taken the stony by their, at least by their own people. Y'all don't understand when the Romans, the Romans went after some of these Jewish people who, who were rebelling. You know what they decided? Here's our choices. We could die by the hands of the Romans or we can kill ourselves. You know what they did? They killed themselves up in the mountains and stuff. They would rather have died by the hands of themselves or their own people than to be handed and, 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 and killed by the Romans. You think that? Listen. The Lord Jesus, he was so treated unfairly by his people. They didn't have the, there were times where they were going to stone him and stuff. Wasn't it time? That would have been, a, in a Jew's mind, that would have been a greater death than to be handed over and crucified by the Romans. Even the death of the cross. And then what happened before he was, he was all beaten and all that stuff? After that, he suffered in his soul. That's what the death of the cross, right? He was rejected by his own people, handed over to these heathen. Imagine these heathen touching him, the holy son of God, with their dirty, uncircumcised hands. Mocking and spitting on him, putting a crown of thorns that size on his head, taking his stuff and just mocking him. They, they stabbed him. Oh, that's the holy son of God, his holy temple, his body. But because of that, notice what the father did. Wherefore, God also. You see, God responds in kind. That word also. He didn't just say God hath. It says because of what he did, God also does something. And the point is, that's what Paul is saying. As we suffer for the truth, he, he, he suffered for the truth because that was his truth from the Old Testament. And he suffered with it. He, he suffered for it. That's what it is. He says, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. And given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus. This is why he's Lord. Every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess Amen. that Jesus Christ is Lord yes. to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed. See, Paul says that same principle. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own. Jesus worked out his salvation. Work out your own salvation. And he did it. And he says to do it with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The point is that issue of the Lord. He, he sacrificed himself. He lived that life of sacrificial obedience and sacrifice. And it led to glory. And that's the grace of God that Paul's talking about. Go up with me in Romans 16. Go to Romans 16. When you think about God's grace, it's beyond just salvation. It's not just him saving you. You can get denominational brethren and sisters to agree that God saves you today by God's by his grace through faith plus no works. Now they confuse it. Then they add water baptism. This is crazy to me. You say. Uh, is water baptism a requirement for salvation? They'll say, oh, no, 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 no. Then why do you do it? And the only answer is. They have to make up some wisdom of words. It's an outward sign of inward faith. Uh, you follow Jesus and whatever, all of the nonsense they come up with. It's not a requirement. So here's the question. Anybody ever said to say this? If it's not required. So I can trust Christ, what he did at Calvary, and I can never be water baptized. I'm OK with God. It's not a requirement. Right. And then they'll come up with some nonsense, some wisdom of word. They'll talk like a politician. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know. No. Quote another, yeah, because yeah. they don't really believe what they're saying. Because somebody like you or me, we would say, um, Acts 238, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. As soon as somebody says to me, that's how my mind works, 
It's not required. Yep, it's by grace alone. Water baptism not required. I go, they, because they don't rightly divide, so they don't know that Peter is a different. I said, well, why did Peter said this? And they'd be like, mm. well, really, what Peter meant, and then they go into their politician talk. What do you mean? <laughs> Politicians, they are trapped. They could say what they, and they go, well, what I meant, I was taking myself out of context there. And I'm just like, no, they drive me crazy because they're liars. Well, let me tell you what Paul says. When Paul talks about the grace of God, look at Romans uh, chapter number 16. And notice, look at verse 20. He goes through this. He says, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. You know, what he's talking about he's, he's going all the way back to Genesis three when God says, he shall bruise thy, thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Speaking of the Messiah, right? And the seed of the, the seed of the serpent. And that issue of bruise Satan under your feet shortly, he will give you victory, peace and victory. And the shortly has to do when Paul wrote the book of Romans, he didn't have the full revelation of the mystery yet, right? But can I tell you something? What he's saying is once we get the full revelation of the mystery, once that appearing is complete as far as the doctrine, once that preaching of the cross is finished, you can have Satan under your feet. The average denominational church, they all worried about what Satan is doing, right? Satan been busy. You ask him, how you doing? How you? Satan been busy, brother. Well, I know he's been busy since before Adam, okay? What they got to do with us today? We're not ignorant of his devices. But the fact is, I got a verse where Paul says, if you know the mystery, because notice what he says in verse 20, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Right out, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So he's saying how you're going to defeat him is by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That understanding of the doctrine that the Apostle Paul received. Look at verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is of power to establish you. As, as Paul ends this book, as he talks about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to break it down according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now it's made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets. He's talking about the un, uh, understanding of the rightly divided word of God. All of God's word rightly divided. If you understand this Bible rightly divided and you believe it, Satan cannot Destroy it. But you got to understand it rightly divided. T commandment of everlasting God, notice, made known to all nations. That was, more, that was unique to Paul, apostle of the nations. For the obedience of faith to God only wise, the wisdom of God, he called Satan in his craftiness, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Look with me, if you will, at 1 Corinthians 16. Notice how Paul is ending these books. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. In 1 Corinthians 16, look at verse number 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As he, as he ends this book to the Corinth Corinthians, he pronounces a blessing, an apostolic blessing in particular. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And that you has to do with all of them. But to remind him, because he did have to reprove him a lot in this book. He had to deal with him. I like how he ends it. Normally he ends the book, check this out, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He's talking about that, that, that truth committed to the Apostle Paul. But notice this. Like a father, after having to spank his child, he says, my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Why did he end it like that? Because he did have to be harsh on him. Read the book of 1 Corinthians. He had to be harsh. And as he ends the book, he wants to reconfirm his love for them. He's saying, yes, I had to be harsh, but I love you. My love be with you all in Christ that was Jesus. Extra. That was extra. That comes from his heart there. The he, just with be with exactly. He's saying, he's saying, look, it's not just the message. I, the messenger, love you. OK, because he had to do that because he had to he had to really get on them in this book. All right. Look at um, 2 Corinthians 13. 2 Corinthians 13.
again with the Corinthians, right? He always has to deal with the, their issues. Verse number uh, 14. Right, we're going, to, we're going to talk about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he calls it the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to motivate them by the message given to the Lord that they're held accountable. Notice, and the communion of the Holy Ghost. What was the problem at Corinth? Well, what, pick one, right? Not, 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 uh, not understanding and appreciating Paul's apostleship, his ministry, his message, his authority. But can I tell you what else was a problem? Communion, right? He, this is the group of saints he had to write, 1 Corinthians 11. When you guys come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord, you're not, tearing, you're not tearing. And so he says, the communion of the Holy Ghost. He understood that the Holy Ghost is with them. You know what Paul tells the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6? Don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? And he's saying, if, this is what he's saying, practically. He's saying, if the Holy Ghost is in each and every one of you all, then you can commune together. The communion of the Holy Ghost. Sorry, I, I, I missed the love. And the love of God. Well, that one's, you got the Father, you got the, you got the Son, the Lord Jesus. The love of God, that's God the Father. I only have one child, but I, I want to talk to some of the people who have multiple children. It seems to me, if I had ten children and they were, they were, they were fighting amongst themselves, that would hurt my heart as a father like nothing else because you love them all. They're all your children. And if they're fighting and they're, and they're striving together, you'd want them to all get along. You say, stop this, right? The love of God. And what Paul wanted them all to do instead of strive to labor, have the, had God's love among one, one with another. That was a problem there. The love of God. And then he talks about the communion of the Holy Ghost, that closeness, that oneness. Motivated by the Lord Jesus, who, who suffered for you. Having the love of God, that charity, that labor of love, tearing one for another. The Corinthians lacked that. And that communion of the Holy Ghost, sharing in this truth together. It's that oneness. He's the one who had, he's the one told him in 1 Corinthians, the body is one, so also is Christ. So he had to remind him, by the way, you see the Godhead right there too. That's one of the reasons I like this verse. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's the Son. The love of God, there's the Father. And the communion of the Holy Ghost, there's the Holy Ghost. That's one God, three persons right there. That's the Godhead. So that's a good verse to show people, the Godhead, okay? All right, go to, go to Galatians chapter 6. We're going to be starting the book of Galatians on Wednesday. Galatians chapter 6, verse 18. Now here... Because of what he's trying to deal with, the Corinthians were trying to serve God in their flesh, right? Um, look at, before we look at the last verse of it, go, um, go to Galatians 3.3. 3. So they grow in the Lord. So they have to learn the truth of right. right. Yep. Because this is what, watch this. What was even sadder about these people is they did run well. They actually were walking in the, the knowledge that the Spirit of God gave them. This is before the Word was complete, but the Spirit of God revealed mystery truths, right? And they didn't walk in it. Notice this is verse 3. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the what? The flesh. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Now, go over to the end of the book. Go to, look at chapter 6, verse 18. Interesting that he ends it like this. I'm, I'm going to throw a little wrinkle in there. He does. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He's saying, listen, remember, God accepts you positionally on the basis of grace. But that grace has free responsibility. You've got to walk in these things. And then he says, with your spirit. Paul wanted to remind them where we worship God is in spirit, right? We learned in John's study, God is a spirit. And they which worship him must worship him in where? In spirit and in truth. Paul says in Romans 1, God whom I serve with my what? Spirit. He's reminding these saints where we serve God. Yes, it comes out in, in, in reality in our, in our good works. But where it starts, where it starts, it starts in your spirit. Paul calls it the spirit of your mind. Where the Holy Spirit resides, where he is, 
to help the saint understand the word and so forth is it's a spirit where we serve God. We are the circumcision which worship God in the what? The spirit, Philippians 3. That's where Paul says, Romans 1, I serve God with my spirit. And he's trying to remind these saints, stop focusing on the outward, trying to do all these things, being busy and serving. By the way, what is the spirit? That's where the word of God is going to be. Here's what he's telling them. Do the work of faith. When you do the work of faith, you get in God's word, rightly divided, it, it, will, it should produce, if you believe it, the what? Labor of love. They were so focused on doing the quote-unquote labor of love. Get this. They were so focused on doing things like Martha that they forgot, oh, the first thing I need to do is get the right word in me, right? They were busy. Paul says, are you now trying to be perfected by the flesh? They were doing things. It just wasn't the, in the truth. In the right. They which worship him must worship him in spirit and what? Truth. And that's why he says, brethren, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Look at a few more before we end. We'll deal with amen. Yeah, in busyness. You know what Paul says? Work with quietness. God would rather you know the truth and allow him, it is God which worketh in you, to get, that was Mary, that was Martha's problem in the book of Luke. Mary did some work, she helped him prepare, but when the Lord started talking, Mary shut her mouth, sat there and said, Lord, you now are the focus. Martha was back there complaining, doing stuff, where's my sister, she left off serving. The Lord says, you come, he says, he says like this, Martha, Martha. Whether it's the first or the second. I got to get her name. I got to. I got to look up what her name means. This is significant about her name with Israel. Thou art cumbered about with many things, with much serving. That's religion. You're cumbered about with much serving. It's not about how many things you're doing. It's is it the right things? Mary left off serving. She served. And when the Lord said, <clears throat> ready to preach the word, she says, yes, Lord. And she got down and sat at his feet and heard his word. You know what the Lord says? Mary has done the greater part. She's done. That's the thing she should be doing. What he's saying is, Martha, you need to sit down right here next to your sister and hear the word. See, it's the work of faith. Then it produces the labor of love. And that's why he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Okay. All right. A couple more. Look at Philippians chapter four. Go over to Philippians four. I just want to get some of these on record. So when people watch it over and over, they can look at it themselves. So that grace is more than just positional salvation. It's in your practice. It's in the mystery. And Paul wants to keep that always there. He ends these books like that because they remember this message. Remember this. It says there that the Martha means lady, as in like the female version of Lord, you know, like my Lord, my lady. Interesting. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about that in Q&A. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Martha means lady. Okay, that's significant. Great, great point. Great point. All right, um, Philippians chapter number four, look at verse 23. Verse 22, all the saints salute you, chiefly they that are Caesar's household. Interesting enough, Paul's very presence there got people who were part of Caesar's household say, the grace of, of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Again, as he ends this great book of Philippians, he wants to remind them the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Paul wants to remind them constantly, and, and it's a twofold thing. He's giving them an apostolic, uh, like the priest did in Israel, may the Lord bless and keep you, may his face shine upon you, and all that stuff. You know, they do that in church today. I, I laugh, I go, you know, that was the Levitical, ironic priesthood do that with Israel. What, if, if, if a bishop had to do something, it would be like the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I did my studies uh, in the book of Galatians, I would end each one by saying, or, or you know what, no, it was, it was the radio. When we did radio, we do our study, and I say, uh, until next time, I'm Ron Knight saying, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Because that's what you want to leave them with. I remember, that's when I was saying, okay? And, and I got that from the Apostle Paul, because the last thing he would say what, to resonate is that grace given unto him. May it be with you. Amen. Okay? So a couple more, and then we're going to look at amen, and we'll finish. Um, look at 2 Timothy 
chapter number 4, 2 Timothy 4, verse 22. 2 Timothy 4, verse 22. Now, because he's speaking right to Timothy, watch how he says this. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Now, why say it like that? Because notice, Timothy is a pastor. And there's that onus of being a faithful servant, knowing that the, the judgment seat of Christ, particularly with pastors, is always a motivation, okay? It's for everybody, but I'm telling you, if you're in charge of getting, putting the, you're the vessel that the word is to come out of, that judgment seat of Christ, it, it's, it's, no, no, it's no coincidence that 2 Timothy 2 is where you find a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The last epistle Paul wrote to that, to that uh, minister, that bishop, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Serve him, Timothy, with that spirit. And then he says, grace be unto you. Rest in your understanding. Rest in who you are in Christ. Rest in that understanding of the mystery that I taught you. There's a lot there. It's just, these aren't just words. This is, it's, Timothy is to ponder this. You know, I think about a last will and testament. Or just the last time I've, I've done funerals and I've seen people say, you know what people say in funerals when their loved one died? They go, the last conversation I had with such and such. And they remember that. I think they got shows. People do that. They'll say, you never think about the last time until somebody died. You go, you know what? The last conversation I had with brother such and such. J brother James. Brother, brother James Mason. I'll, I'll, I forget everything. I got so much information coming from people. I get overwhelmed with people's stuff, you know. I, I just, so if I ever say, remind me of something, because I, ha I had to train my mind to take in information and let it go, because <laughs> I get bombarded with people's stuff. But what I remember is this. Brother James, sitting at a table, across the table, at the luncheon, judgment seat of Christ, right before his death, the last thing he said to me in person, at least, I can't remember, if, I think it was in person, the last time I saw him, he says, Brother Ron, you don't have to worry about me when it comes to that. I, I fear that. The, he pointed to the title, Judgment Seat of Christ, as far as how he deals with people. And the point is, I remember that. And I'll always remember that until I see him, okay? Notice that Paul, in his last letter, he writes to Timothy, who was his faithful son in the Lord. He, he writes, the last thing he wrote, period, as far as scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. That's a lot there. Be motivated by the judgment seat. Serve him with your spirit. It's an inner man thing, first Timothy. And remember the message, grace be with you. That's everybody. Paul speaks to Timothy as the pastor. And as Timothy reads, give attendance to reading, he's reading this letter to his saints. Paul says, hey, grace be with you. And obviously they know the grace of the Lord Jesus because he, he's, he's just said it. Amen. Now one more and then we'll look at amen and then. Look at Philemon. Philemon is only one, but go page over. Verse 25. There you go. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking to Philemon here. By the way, right after he reminds Philemon, deal with Brother Onesimus the way God wants you to, as if he's sent from me, as if he's me. He's telling him, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And what I see as Paul, as his message begins to be written down, the issue of serving God, he starts Romans off. Check this out. He starts off Romans. He goes, we, I serve God. I serve God with my spirit. And as, he, and as his ministry coming around, he constantly reminding about that spirit. If he, uh, uh, Philippians, late epistle, he goes, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That is your serving God with your spirit. That's where you serve him, in your spirit. The focus is not so much outside, it's that inner man, that heart. Now, this issue of amen. Paul, you know, when we pray, you ever th think about it when we pray? I pray vocally out for the saints so that you guys could say Amen. When he talks about this amen, that has to do with, it literally means 
so be it, or it is so, right? Sometimes it's barely, right? Sometimes barely, it's truly, yes, right. Sometimes it's it. he's saying, trust it, it's true. Amen, right? By the way, Paul, when I say he, how he ends the book, he ends Romans that way. He'll end books with amen, it is so, right? He's, it, it, and, and like Ryan mentioned, the verily, the truly, this is truly what God has for you today. The, gr- gr- the grace of God be with you, or with your spirit, Amen. It is so. And when Paul says that, it's, it is, he ends the book with that amen because he's saying, it, it is truly true. Like the Jews believe, yes, yes, right? Yes, yes. It is true. It's a fact. It will be. May it be. It is so. All those little var- uh, variations. But he's saying that's what God is doing today. He's verifying at the end that this is what God is going to hold us accountable to. That in our position, we have ever, eternal security, everlasting life. Let it, be. Let it be. But in our practice, too, the judgment seat of Christ is coming, and you have your chance now to get the reward of the inheritance. But you have to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in your spirit in order to do that, okay? All right. We have to end, but we will use this same message for both the Colossians 4, because it's the same thing, uh, as well as the Second Thessalonians. So for those, just know that the, our next Sunday will be in 1 Timothy 1. This Wednesday will be in Galatians 1, okay? Uh, if you've listened to this and, and you're not familiar with these things, first of all, we talked about the position. God's grace can be with you right now, even if you're lost. How? He made the way. He will save you, give you a position of everlasting righteousness, your initial justification, your salvation, He'll save your soul from hell. He wants you to trust his son, the Lord Jesus. He'll make you accepted in the beloved, okay? His beloved son. By your faith, no works. Trust in God's grace through Calvary. If you're saved today, there's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. There's our practice. There's our practical walk. There is that we might be accepted or acceptable. That has nothing to do with your salvation. That's full and free forever. But there are consequ- there's responsibility and consequences, and that is so for your reward. And ultimately, the reward of the inheritance, reigning with Christ, sharing in the glory of God in heavenly places, for his, for, uh, reigning with Christ, who's going to be down here on earth. He's going to reign in the heavens, which are his, through us. But he's only going to do it through the faithful saints. All saints get heaven. Only those who are faithful and loyal to the mystery, the grace of God given to Paul, We'll reign with them, okay? You want to be a joint heir with Christ. We'll help you with that. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can get into your word, Father, whether it's 2 Thessalonians, whether it's Colossians. um, Something never happened before where we're able to end two books at the same time on the exact same verse. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Uh, We look forward. We we thank you for the book of 2 Thessalonians. We now have it recorded and, and out there. For, for, for saints to, to partake of uh, throughout time and memorial. Now, we thank you for uh, the, we thank you for the, the man, the awesome um, honor of being vessels of your truth. It's not about the men, the women. It's about souls who desire to serve you in their spirit and the truth. And yea, when we do that, we will suffer with the Lord Jesus in his truth. But we know that with the suffering comes the glory. The suffering of rejection comes glory. So we thank you, Father, that the Lord, that you're willing to share your heavenly places and your son is willing to share his reign in your heavenly places. We thank you, Father. May, may that be the focus of our hearts in these, in these last of the last of the last days of grace. We look forward to your coming, Lord Jesus Christ. But until then, may we redeem the time in in, in your precious word. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.